So welcome to the last session of this really impressive conference. Um, and uh, I just, uh, I'll be moderating this. I'm Nancy Messner here at Utah State. Uh, a couple of announcements, bef just real briefly. Um, it'll be the same round roundup of speakers. Uh, I'll be flashing cards. I think most of the people, if, you, if you're speaking in this session and haven't um, checked in with, with me, I think we've got everything loaded up and we'll have a two second um, discussion before you get started. Um, please, I encourage everybody to stick around right through the end of this session. The last talk, the Keystone talk, is also our, the seminar for our college, College of Natural Resources. I think it's going to be really a good talk. And um, Haida uh, offered to anchor this and be the last speaker, even though it's a perilous place to be. Um, and I think it'll be worth sticking around for. So I encourage everybody to stay through that. And. Um, so before, at that point then, I think I'd like to just get started with our first speaker, who is Greg Bevinger. Greg is a uh, professional hydrologist. He um, had worked for over 35 years as a hydrologist, mostly for the U.S. Forest Service in various places, ended his career here in um, Salt Lake City um, with the Forest Service, retired a couple of years ago, and since then has, um, is, has been functioning as the owner and, uh, of a company called Wyo Hydro. Did I say that right? <laughs> uh, professional hydrology services, um, especially specializing in both rural and wildland hydrology. And he's going to be talking today about um, a, a procedure for determining stream and riparian conditions, existing and desired conditions, um, so the, when they're subject to ungulate use. So come on up, bro. Well, welcome back from lunch. Um, thank you, Nancy. I want to thank the organizers for this. Um, it, 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 this session has been really, really good. Um, Nancy mentioned I retired a few years ago. Actually, it was only six months ago. But um, I got started on this work while I was still with the Forest Service probably about a year ago. Um, and it was in response to a request from the hydrologists on the um, three forests in southern Utah who were sort of tasked with um, serving on a team to <laughs> deal with a, an, an amendment to their forest plan for uh, um, livestock grazing on those, on those three forests. And, through a series of meetings that they've been having on these forests, that, you know, they were starting these conversations about what they wanted these streamside and, and uh, 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 the riparian areas to be looking like in the future. And, you know, they, uh, you know, start thinking, well, how can we even start talking about what we want these systems to look like at some point in the future when we don't even know what they look like now. And <clears throat> um, so, you know, I started having conversations with them about that because it's, you know, it's, it, it was certainly a, you know, a um, kind of striking situation to be in. Um, and so through a lot of conversation and, and work, you know, we, we sort of came up with this kind of process. And then, you know, I was asked by the organizers of this, of, of this conference to speak at, the, at this conference back, um, oh, I think it was probably back in March or so. And, you know, I was fully planning on, it, on sharing this information from a Forest Service perspective, but then, you know, I, I retired in April. Um, and I got to thinking about it, though, that, you know, um, this, this procedure really isn't... Uh, um, Forest Service centric. In other words, you know, it, 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 it doesn't just necessarily fit, you know, within the boundaries of a of a national forest. It it, it, it could perhaps actually be used elsewhere. <clears throat> so there's kind of four themes I want to go over um, this afternoon. One is, uh, you know, um, what is the uh, need for the procedure? Um, in follow-up to uh, Mark's presentation yesterday, um, you know, right after lunch, 
uh, talk a little bit more about um, you know what the difference is between uh, um, having an overall kind of future stream and riparian area condition versus having to first have that you know those, those base physical condition needs or hydrologic function and, and then spend some time t t uh, going through the four steps of the procedure and then um, share a, a few examples at the end. You know, um, since this conference is, is, is being held in Utah, you know, you know I'm kind of um, uh, framing it around the, the state of Utah. If I was given this presentation in, in just about any other western state, I think I could frame it around that state, you know, Wyoming, uh, Nevada, whatever. Uh, but, but the primary purpose of the procedure is, is to prioritize the maintenance, improvement, and restoration of, of riparian areas that are subject to uh, you know, some um, sort of grazing use. Um, as all of you know, Utah is a very large landscape. Um, there's over 30,000 miles of streams and river spread across the state that flows through uh, uh, multiple ownerships um, and you know I think the need for the procedure is is really captured by this graph that's out of the most recent state of Utah uh, in, integrated report which is a, uh, a report that every state has to prepare every other year um, per uh, um, section 305 of the Clean Water Act where the, the, the state has, has identified a concern with hydrologic function on well over um, uh, half of the stream miles you know, across the state. And that doesn't necessarily mean that hydrologic concern is related to um, you know, uh, 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 you know, livestock grazing. Um, there's other types of activities that affect hydrologic function, um, storm runoff out of urban areas, uh, you know, some road systems and, and, and mining and those kinds of things. But, but some of that concern certainly is, uh, uh, you know, uh, related to uh, livestock grazing. <coughs> Um, and that, that need is kind of further um, shown in, in this graphic also out of that report, which, which shows that that hydrologic function concern is the uh, main stressor on uh, um, what's going on in terms of the uh, um, uh, fishes and other sorts of aquatic biota that are in these stream systems. Um, you, you know, it's been my experience and, uh, you know, over the years that, uh, and, you know, I think this, this was the situation that these hydrologists were facing down there on those three southern Utah forests. Um, you know, th this concept of overall future condition falls, um, you know, whoops, excuse me, um, somewhere, you know, out here on, on, on this end of this continuum. And oftentimes that's where we start our conversations. We talk about, uh, you know, what we want these systems to look like at some point in the future, what kind of values we want to get out of these systems um, in, in, in terms of socioeconomic and, and, and natural values. Um, but in my mind, we're, you know, sort of getting the cart in front of the horse here because we haven't had any conversation or a good hard look at, at whether or not we even have hydrologic function, and if we don't have that hydrologic function, then it's it, it's very hard to even start having these kind of conversations. And and so I would suggest that, and this is in follow up to what Mark was talking about yesterday, um, this overall desired condition is really unachievable unless we have three things going on in, in the stream that we're dealing with. That stream has to have access to its floodplain, has to be able to move the sediment load that, that, that is, is um, you know, trying to move through the system, and the stream has to be able to maintain, uh, you know, some sort of water table there. So um, if we don't have these 
these three things going on, we're not at hydrologic function. If we're not at hydrologic function, we can't be talking about you know, all these other values that we want to get out of these areas. And so what the procedures kind of set up to do is to kind of get the horse back in the lead by first looking at this, at this area over here on this continuum. You know, are, are we dealing with a, a system that is at hydrologic function or is it functioning at risk or are we perhaps dealing with a system that's non-functional? So the first step then is to figure out what your current or existing situation is. Um, you know, I, there, there's probably multiple ways to skin this cat. All of you know there's a lot of tools to try and get at this kind of stuff. Um, a lot of those tools um, you know, have been shared with um, you know, um, some of the information that you saw you know, across the hall there with some of the posters. You know, I suggest the use of the, of the proper functioning condition protocols. Because we're dealing with grazing um, and, and these large landscapes, you know, I suggest that we, we only focus in those valley types that support ROSG and CNE stream types. Reason uh, being is that those are the stream types that are most um, sensitive to and, and susceptible to, to grazing. It's primarily because the stability in those stream types is uh, you know, a function of the vegetation, um, which is you know, primarily your, your carex and salix species. Um, and so, it, it, you know, you, you all saw this yesterday with Mark's presentation, um, the, uh, the, the user guide for, for the proper function condition assessment. Um, within that publication, Mark didn't share this, but there, there's a graphic that shows, uh, and, and perhaps it's oversimplified, but it shows that there's basically six stream states. Um, where, where here with state A, um, you're basically dealing with an undisturbed or um, you know, a, a system that is, that's more or less in a natural condition. And then as you apply grazing pressure, if you're not careful, you can work down into these various states to where you could get into a state C or D. And then um, if, if for whatever reason that grazing pressure changes, then the stream through evolutionary sequence could work back towards um, a state E or F. You may never get back to a state A because typically what happens here is you have a pretty significant drop in the water table. You're reestablishing hydrologic function, but you're doing so at a, at a lower elevation. Um, you know, of, of all the available uh, valley types we have out there on the landscape, um, again, only focus on those that um, where you would expect to find a C or E stream type um, and, uh, uh, and, and not focus on those others. And again, we're just focusing on the, the C and E stream types, which are your meandering, low elevation, or uh, low gradient stream systems. And you can get at this through uh, Rosgen level one geomorphic characterization. Dealing with large landscapes, you can do it through uh, aerial photo, uh, satellite imagery, topographic map exercise. Uh, if you're dealing with a smaller area, um, say like a small ranch, um, you could perhaps just do it through some relatively simple field work. So now you know what your existing condition is. Um, the, the next step then is through an uh, interdisciplinary conversation, decide what stream state you need to to be at in order to be at that, that hydrologic or base physical condition. Um, and I, I'm not gonna read through all of these in the interest of time, but you basically if you're at state A, obviously you'd wanna stay at A. If you're at F, you'd probably wanna stay at F unless there is opportunity to move it back towards A. If, if you're here at B, you wanna maintain there because you don't wanna be pushing it into one of these more degraded stream states. If you're one of these, you want to try and move it back uh, either towards a B or move it towards a more stable state E. 
So you know what you have, you know where you need to be to be at that base physical condition. So the next step then is through a prioritization process, which I'll cover in just a minute, um, do whatever adjustments and management you need to do to, to, to be able to change that stream state. And then initiate monitoring, um, which is a, a very necessary and important step in order to be able to determine um, if, um, if your improvements that you're wanting, your, you know, you're achieving those or, or being maintained. And I recommend you, you, uh, you know, implement um, your monitoring through designated monitor areas using the multiple indicator monitoring protocols that Mark went over yesterday. Um, and, you know, it, uh, you know uh, again, as Mark shared with you, this is the user guide for MIM. Um, and the prioritization, I, I would suggest, uh, you know, because you're dealing with large landscapes and perhaps multiple stream systems in various stream states, you obviously can't do monitoring on everything um, because it is expensive and time consuming and um, um, would be to, to establish a prioritization system where uh, your highest priority would be monitoring these state B and state E situations because uh, through mismanagement you could easily push a state B into a C or push the state E back into a C or a D. Um, and you know, we have a lot of systems uh, across the state that um, have evolved back into this because of um, changes in management already. And, and we don't want to you know, step backwards there. We have a lot of systems that are operating on the edge here that you know, I, I would suggest we want to try and keep those so we don't have to deal with any more of these than we have to. And there are already plenty of these on the landscape as well. The lowest priority would be if you're in uh, state A or F, with the argument being that you must be doing something right with your management because you're at functioning condition or higher. Um, so that kind of explains that, 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 that rationale there. I you know, kind of got ahead of myself a little bit. Um, but uh, again, the focus would be on, on these systems that are, that you know, kind of have the potential to get worse or go back to, to a, a, condi a, a worse condition that they were in previously and um, focus on those first. Um, focus on these second and then focus on the, the ones that are in pretty good shape last. And then finally step four, um, which, you know, again, is, is, it oftentimes seems to be where we actually start our conversation rather than where we end it. Um, you, you know, once you know that you're at that base physical condition, you have that hydrologic function that you need um, in order to be able to start that conversation about what you want um, in terms of future condition. Um, and, you know, and so once you're at that point, then you can start asking this question about what sort of uh, uh, management, additional management adjustments, if any, do we need to make in order to be able to support that social, economic, or ecological benefits that we're trying to get out of, out of these systems. So just real quickly, a few examples. Um, the photograph in the upper right is, uh, is perhaps an example the, of a system that's in state A or F. Um, it, this, this happens to be a photograph of a, uh, it's hard to tell, but it's it, actually a situation that's in state F. It's in a very incised valley bottom um, that's worked through that evolutionary sequence, they've done management adjustments. You know, I would suggest this is a, a low priority in terms of monitoring because whatever they're doing, they're, they're doing it right because we're at hydrologic function and we're getting some of these other resource values. This example here in the upper left and the, and the lower left, this may be where you're at, at a, a state B. This would be perhaps where you're at a, a state E. You know, these would be your highest priority for monitoring um, because you don't want to see this move towards a state E or, or, or a, a C or D, and you don't want to see this move back to a C or D. 
And so establish your MEM monitoring on these sites. Do whatever adjustments and current management you need to to try and, and, and either get these at proper functioning condition for that state or move them back to a state A in this case or towards a state F in this case. And then uh, if you're dealing with a situation like this where you're at a state C or D, this, but you also have these on the landscape you're dealing with, this would be a, your lowest priority because you, you, know, you want to make sure this doesn't get worse and this doesn't go back to being worse. Um, so focus here and make this a little bit lower priority. If this is all you're dealing with on your landscape, then obviously you know, this situation would be your, your highest priority. So I, you know, I shared with you that there is concern as evidenced by the, you know, by Utah's integrated report uh, with stream and riparian health due to grazing effects on hydrologic function. Um, that, uh, as Mark stressed yesterday, there's a need for his physical health before you can start having these overall desired condition conversations. Um, shared with you a, a prioritized methodology for addressing that concern that focuses first on, uh, or focuses on stream types most susceptible to, to grazing. The focus is first on those existing conditions that you can most likely improve with a minimal amount of investment. You don't have to do a lot of change in management to move from a, uh, you know, a, or, or to, to get a state B in, in, at PFC or move it towards A, or um, you maintain a, a state E at PFC or, or move it towards a state F. And then focus second on those existing conditions i.e. a state C or D that uh, are, are likely going to require more investment. You're probably going to have to make much harder choices and changes in management, um, probably ramp up monitoring effort quite a bit as well. So uh, with that, I'll take questions. Yeah, kind of. <laughs> the lights are bright. What's the concern about focusing first on physical? I remember seeing a, a stream team slide where they were talking about, well, this stream is stabilized. And I said, well, isn't that weak canary grass in the photo? And they said, yes. But, you know, we needed to stabilize the physical. And to me, that's, that's, that's that separation of thinking physical only and not thinking the larger. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that may very well be true. Um, okay, um, the, the, the question related to, to how you, you may have a, a, a stream system where your, your vegetation is a, is a non-native or an invasive that, um, you know, um, somebody might argue that that it's, a, it's sufficient vegetation to, to, to be able to call that system stable. It's at hydrologic function. You know, I'm not sure I would agree that, um, it, and, and if you work through the, the proper functioning condition protocols, it, it looks at invasives. And so if, if I were doing it, I'm not sure I would, would say a system supported by, by that particular kind of vegetation is stable. Um, you know, I, that, that's where the importance of that interdisciplinary conversation comes in, hopefully you have a vegetation expert, a botany expert on your team that can say, look, you know, this, yeah, there's, there's vegetation on this system. It, it appears to be stabilizing the banks, but it's non-native. And, um, and, and, and so you would, you would check that box on the PFC form um, and, and, and likely rate that as, uh, uh, perhaps functioning at risk. Good question. There was one over here. No? Okay. Any other questions? Okay, thank you. <laughs>